Now we really are in Exodus, unlike the Genesis passage to which I turned a little earlier this morning. Exodus chapter 4, today we're looking at verses 10 through 12. The message is entitled, Disobeying God, Excuse Number One. How many excuses we have are uh, unfathomable, but the one that Moses tried, excuse number one, is one that all of us have tried at some point or another, I believe, in our Christian life. It's a very common excuse. It's an excuse that we see taking place on a daily basis in the lives of most Christians. And that's where we'll be going today. Before we begin, let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that you are our Father and that you love us. That you are very patient and tolerant of us, very long-suffering. For we are a people who likes to argue with you. We're a people who frequently disobeys you. But we are your children. And so rather than disowning us completely, you chasten us. You direct us to your word. You teach us what is right. You bring us back on path again. And when we disobey, you do it all over again. Time after time after time after time. Father, how we thank you for that. We certainly don't deserve it. But we thank you that you are God and that you love us, that you care for us, and that you do bring us into line to do what you have called us to do. Keep us from being like Jonah who tried to run away. You got him back on track through a very miserable channel. Help us, Father, to be people who delight to do your will. Cause us to learn the importance of obedience rather than being resistant and stubborn. Help us to be a people who wants to obey. We start with that premise before we even hear the command. Father, we pray for your blessings on the going forth of your word this day that it will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish that which you have sent it forth to do in each of our hearts. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You recall that the two messages immediately preceding the message for today are very critical for understanding the excuse that Moses gives here in verses 10 through 12. We read it just a few moments ago about Moses claiming to be not able to speak and not eloquent and a stutterer and all the things that go along with that and how absolutely foolish it was for God to even choose him because after all, he's not a very good instrument. And God, of course, says, I know, that's why I chose you. <laughs> the reason God chooses us is not because we are good. The reason God chooses us is not because we are talented. The reason God chooses us is not because we've got it together. God chooses us and uses us because none of those things are true of us. And he gets the glory. You recall how God started in verses 1 through 5. The message then was entitled, When You Carry a Snake. Moses had argued with God and said, They won't believe me. They won't hear my voice. They'll say, The Lord has not appeared unto thee. He gave three different arguments as to why it couldn't possibly be him that needs to be used. And God asked him, what's that in your hand? And he said, oh, it's a rod. And he gave the stupid answer of earth. He didn't see anything beyond the potential of a rod that he could beat sheep with and beat up wolves with and lean on when he was tired. He saw no potential at all. And God was about to teach him a lesson. It was something that Moses liked. It was something that Moses had carried for a long time. It was something that Moses considered his own possession, but God was going to show him that his own possessions were dangerous. Until he had given it to God, it was a dangerous thing, and God told him, throw it down, and it became a snake, and Moses fled from it, and God said, pick it up, and I'm sure with great trepidation, Moses picked it up and it became a rod again. And Moses began to learn that it was not just his rod, it was the rod of God powerful lesson for us to learn as we look at all the different things that God has entrusted to our care. We saw the three faulty premises of Moses' arguments. The fear of man, which is always stupid, 
expectation that success is dependent on Moses rather than God. That is never true. And belief that other people can and always will withstand the sovereign, immutable will and direction of God. And that's always impossible. <laughs> Three arguments that Moses hadn't really thought through when he's talking to the sovereign God of the universe. When we argue with God, it's always stupid, it's always based on a lie, and it's always doomed to failure. The next thing that we learned was that when God asks a question, it is to instruct us not to gain information for himself. When God asked that second question, he dealt with the hand of Moses as well. Not merely what's in your hand, but take your hand now and stick it into your bosom. The hand is the thing that we do most of the things in life with, that we do. It's a valuable member of the body. People without hands have a very difficult time doing anything. The hand is what we write with. The hand is what we type with. The hand is what we pick up things with. The hand is where we reach into our wallet and pull out our money and pay at the store. The hand is a very essential item and God wanted him to understand that God can take away the most essential things in our lives and give them a living death as he gave Moses leprosy if we don't use them for his glory. What's in your hand? How do you use your hand? God can remove the most valuable things that you have in your life and he can give them a long, slow, lingering, stinking, ugly death. That's what leprosy does. And we looked at all the different ways in which leprosy is used in the scripture. What do you have in your hand? And remember what's in your hand can be taken away. It can be used with power for God. It can be taken away and given a long, lingering, ugly death. <clears throat> Last week we looked at leprosy faith. And we saw that God established a principle which he himself follows in this passage, that at the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. And God gave Moses three different witnesses to bear before Pharaoh, so that Pharaoh would understand that Moses was speaking a word from the living God. When Jesus came into the world, God gave at least ten witnesses, or groups of witnesses, to the person and work of Christ. John the Baptist, the works of Christ, the Father himself, Jesus himself, the disciples, the scripture, the Holy Spirit, and the angels, and the demons. We saw the verses where all those are listed for us. Jesus established again that two or three witness principle in the Gospels when he said, If he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more than in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every witness, uh, every word may be established. We saw that was a principle that God tells us to use in the church. Second Corinthians 13, 1, this is the third time I'm coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses, shall every word be established. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. And finally we saw that God will still use that principle even during the tribulation period. And God gave Moses in this passage three witnesses as proof of the veracity of Moses' testimony before he sent the plagues to Egypt. He gave him the rod, he gave him the leprous hand, he gave him the pitcher of water that then became blood. Leprosy is deadly. Leprosy is a picture of sin. We looked at ten different things that related to leprosy in the Old Testament. We'll not go over those today. That brings us to the message today, disobeying God. Excuse number one. And Moses said unto the Lord, Oh my Lord, I am not eloquent. No, but you're a crybaby. Neither heretofore, I didn't used to be one. It's not that I lost it, I never was, and nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, I didn't suddenly get it. But I am slow of speech and of this. Slow tongue. The first excuse that Moses brings, which is an excuse that we often bring for disobeying God, is his human limitations. Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent. Moses is claiming to have two different kinds of limitations. First, he's claiming his physical incapacity, an incapacity that 
should be evident and obvious to other people. They listen to Moses, and then they turn on the television and listen for five minutes, and they get to Moses' second word. And then they listen to the radio for a while, and they get to Moses' third word. I am not eloquent! He has an incapacity that means he can't accomplish what other people can accomplish. How often have you said that to God? God, I really can't do that. I mean, there are people who are better at it than I am, so, so I can just sit back and relax while somebody else in the church does it. Dear people, that's the Moses excuse. When you see something that you know God could use you to do, don't look at how good you are. Look at how good God is. Don't look at how strong you are. Look at how strong God is. Don't look at how accomplished you are. Look at how accomplished God is. What needs to be done? If God has brought something to your attention and you have walked by it, like deliberately, for two weeks, there was a couple of pieces of paper and a couple of leaf petals down here in front. And I looked at them and I thought... I wonder if anybody will pick those up. And you know what? They didn't. Last Sunday, there was a little strip of paper about this long, a much narrower area, so everybody would have seen it. Not through this door, but when you get down to the next door, the one that goes out into the hall. The garbage can was right there, so you wouldn't even have to carry it very far. But uh, it was a little tiny strip of paper with little holes in it got torn off of something something that had perforations. And um, it was sitting right there in front of the door, and I thought, I'm going to leave that there. I'm going to see if anybody picks it up. Nobody picked it up. Now, I eventually did pick it up. I threw it in the trash can. Same thing with this stuff down here. People, don't expect somebody else to do it. That's Moses' excuse number one. There's going to be somebody who's better than I am at this. People, what needs to be done? How about your next door neighbor? When was the last time you talked to them about Jesus? Well, there are better people at it than I am. Surely some church around here will send out a, a gung-ho visitation team and they'll go and knock on that door and lead them to Christ and then... They'll look at me and say, where do you go to church? I want to go. <laughs> I don't think so. Excuse number one. A physical incapacity you can't accomplish what other people can accomplish. You know, the second thing that's also here in this verse is he also implies that he has a mental incapacity. He's not a quick thinker. He can't think on his feet. I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Moses is telling God that he can't talk and tie his shoes at the same time. He can't answer the verbal challenges as they come thrusting at him with like swords. Remember, he grew up in Egypt and he saw them debating back and forth. He grew up in Pharaoh's household. He was 40 years old by the time he left. He's claiming that he's a dullard after all those years in the desert yelling at stupid sheep. This excuse goes back to the false premise that we've already discussed. Assuming that success depends on ourselves rather than knowing that success depends on God. People, we need to learn that lesson. Our responsibility is obedience. Success is God's responsibility. We don't have to decide because the conclusion is this, therefore we will not obey. God sent Jeremiah. Jeremiah obeyed, but God told him, Oh, by the way, when you get out there, they're not going to listen to you. God told him in advance. Their faces are going to be like flint. They're going to be hard against you. They don't want to hear the message I'm telling you to bring. But Jeremiah went. Jeremiah brought the message. Jeremiah got stuck into a cistern up to his armpits in sludge. But Jeremiah obeyed. Let me give you an example of how many of us have assumed that false premise of assuming that success depends on ourselves rather than knowing it depends on God. Do you have money? Do you think that you got it because you're clever? Or because you're talented? 
or because you invested it so wisely. Remember what God says about it, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. It is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. Financial success does not depend on you. It never did. It depended on God, and God can make it disappear overnight. God can blow on your money, and it will be carried away. Let me read you just a few verses. This is Isaiah 40, 24, and then I'm going to read one out of Isaiah 21, or excuse me, Ezekiel 21 and Ezekiel 22. Yea, they shall not be planted, yea, they shall not be sown, yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth, and he shall blow also upon them, and they shall wither, and the whirlwind shall take them away as the stubble. That's what God can do to you. Ezekiel 21. And I will pour out mine indignation upon thee, I will blow against thee in the fire of my wrath, and deliver thee into the hand of brutish men, and skillful to destroy. They're real dum-dums, but they do know how to kill people. Ezekiel 22, 21. Yea, I will gather you and blow upon you in the fire of my wrath, and ye shall be melted in the midst thereof. You know what? God explains in different places why. It's because of their disobedience. But he tells us in one place a specific sin, why he blew upon their wealth and made it evaporate. Haggai chapter 1, verse 9. Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. Hmm, interesting indictment. Don't ever come to God with the excuse that you have human limitations. When God commands you to do something in his word, when God gives a command, three different things happen. Number one, he makes a way to do it. Amazing. God never tells you to walk into a wall without making a door in the wall. When God tells you to do something, he makes a way to do it. Number two, when God tells you to do something, he gives the power to do it. Forget the human limitations argument. Number three, when God tells you to do something, he shows you step by step how you personally fit into his plan. Most of the time, the reasons we don't want to obey fall into one of four categories, sometimes into more than one. Number one, the reason we don't obey is we are lazy and slothful. Man, you mean I have to actually show up at the church and do some work or come to some services or special events? Whoa, yo, that's inconvenient. And that's hard. Two, second reason we don't obey, we're covetous of the resources that God has entrusted to us and we only want to spend them on ourselves. Man, I know we're behind in our missionary budget. And only $60 came into the pastor's salary last week. But hey, I'm saving to buy a new car. Third reason we don't obey. We're walking in the flesh and catering to the old sin nature. Yeah, I know I should pay more attention to witnessing and bringing my neighbors to church. But hey, it isn't really all that much fun. Or four, we're proud and we think that we know better ways to use the resources, including our time, which is a very important resource we often forget, that God hasn't thought of before. Yes, God, I know I should read my Bible more than five minutes, and I know I should pray real prayers, not just selfish prayers for what I want, but I really need to make sure that I listen to the evening news and read the stock market pages in the New York Times. Friends, all of those reasons are nuts. And every one of those reasons will get us fried if we try to use them on God. Secondly, we've gotten to point two. It becomes clear from God's answer to Moses that Moses is accusing God of making some mistakes. Did you get that? Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. What is Moses accusing God of? God is the creator. He's saying, it's God's fault that Moses was made the way that he was made. Have you ever come to God and said, I don't like the way you made me? 
Some of us get up in the morning and we look in the mirror and we say, Whoa, is that what I look like? It's like the old limerick. My face, I don't mind it because I'm behind it. It's folks out in front that I jar. <laughs> Dear friends, God made you exactly the way you are. He's the creator. He says so in the verse next. We don't like our limitations. We don't like our handicaps. God takes the credit, not just the blame. God takes the credit for making those who are dumb and deaf and seeing and blind. That's the challenge that he slaps Moses across the face with. Moses, you're belly aching to me about something that I made. If I want to use what I have made, do you not think that I can use it? It's God's fault that Moses was made the way he was made, and Moses isn't happy about it. Two, Moses is complaining here that God hasn't changed the problem, even since, while, and or during the conversation in which God has just appointed Moses to be his man. Did you get that? He says, I'm not eloquent, neither heretofore, I wasn't eloquent in the past, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. You didn't do anything to change me. You just told me what to do. God can take you and use you with whatever handicap you have. We have no excuse for arguing with God. Moses tries them both here. This is how you made me and you haven't changed me. This is how you made me and I'm stuck with it. How many times have we been angry with God for what he's done in our lives? You took somebody away from us whom we loved. You did something to us where now we can't quite do as many things as we used to. Those of us who are getting older feel that. I can no longer run a mile in less than four minutes and 30 seconds, but I used to be able to. I can't do that anymore. Shall I complain against God for letting me get old? <laughs> some of us do. Shall I complain against God for taking away some dearly loved relatives? Some of us do. Don't accuse God. Don't say, God, you haven't changed the problem. Now that Moses is arguing with God, that belies the very fact that he can't think and talk. He says, you know, I, I'm not able to do this. I can't think on my feet. I can't do what... But I, I, I stutter. I, I, I can't, can't answer. And they've gotten 15 shots at me while I'm trying to get out the answer to the first one. His arguments, he's merely shooting himself in the foot. Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. But I am slow of speech, and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Moses, you're talking to me with a mouth. Who made it? You're complaining about your mouth, Moses. Who made it? Let's talk about some other things that people have problems with. How about the people who can't talk? who are dumb. Would you rather be one of those who can't talk at all? Did you know God can use someone who's dumb, too? How about the people who are blind? Moses, would you like to be blind? You know, God could have done it to him. God told him to stick his hand inside his coat, and he pulled it out, and there it was, leprous. Instantaneous, instant leprosy. How would you like to have a box of instant leprosy? Every time you want to become a leper, you just takes a, a jug of this and you're instantaneously leprous. Moses, who made the deaf? Now, Moses, I think that you probably would rather be deaf right at this point so you can't hear what I'm telling you to do. You ought to be deaf. Some of us complain about getting a little more deaf as we get older. And we've heard some aching about that here in the church because the sermons weren't quite clear enough and we made provision for it. If you can't hear the sermon, pick up one of those headphones. The complaints that we make are not against other people. The complaints that we make are against God. But the real issue here is in this passage is obedience when God speaks. 
Those who don't know God are expected to disobey. That's what we see with Pharaoh, for example, in Exodus 5, two, just, two, just one chapter from where we are now. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Okay, we expect pagans, unbelievers, to reject obedience to God. Pharaoh does it. Pharaoh pays the consequences. The second thing that we learn about obedience, though, is blessing, fellowship, and covenant experience hinge on obedience. Just a few chapters later here in Exodus, Exodus 19, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for the earth is mine. Or Deuteronomy 27, verse 10, Thou shalt therefore obey the voice of the Lord thy God and do his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. It's not merely a matter of believing it. If you believe it, what will you do with it? What you truly believe will change your life. You've heard me say that before. What you truly believe will change your life. How has the gospel affected your life? If there's no change, there's a question as to whether or not it took. Blessings and fellowship. Listen to what Job says. Job 36, 11, and 12. If they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. But if they obey not, they shall perish by the sword, and they shall die without knowledge. Jeremiah 7, 23. But this thing command I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people, and walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. I think too many Christians today flaunt the obedience rule to God and still expect his blessings and his fellowship. Listen to what God told Israel as God prepared them to enter the land of their inheritance. Exodus 23, same book that we're studying. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. We'll see when we get there. This is the angel of the Lord. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary unto thine adversaries. The pronunciation of the blessings and the cursings, which God tells the people to pronounce on Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Deuteronomy chapter 11. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse, a blessing if ye obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if ye will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 4. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. Do you get the idea that God expects obedience? That it's not a sort of take it or leave it kind of a proposition with God? That when he tells us something in his word, he expects us not to overlook it, not to be apathetic about it, not to assume that it's for somebody else. He expects us to obey. America has forgotten that. The church in America has forgotten that. We are an independent nation. We are an independent people. We have independent spirits, independent minds, independent lives. We do what we want to do. Dear friends, you should tremble before a God who expects you to obey him. God eliminates people who refuse to obey him. That's certainly true of the millions he killed in the wilderness wanderings when they refused to go into the promised land after hearing the report of the spies. It was just a little thing. You know, they were scared. Hey, wasn't it okay to be a little scared? I mean, there were giants in the land. Big people! Oh, the fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. And God killed them. And he made them wander around for 40 more years. Do you want to spend your life wandering in the wilderness until you drop dead and God gives the promises to a next generation? Deuteronomy 28, 62, And ye shall be left few in number, 
Whereas ye were as the stars of heaven for multitude, because thou wouldst not obey the voice of the Lord thy God. That first phrase is a phrase to ponder. And ye shall be left few in number. Chapter 30, verse 2, gives us an answer. And shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children with all thine heart and with all thy soul. That's how the few in number increase. As a side note, God expects children to obey their parents. Listen to what happened to disobedient children under the law and be glad that you are not under the law. Deuteronomy 21, beginning in verse 18. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that, when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of the city and unto the gate of his place, and they shall say unto the elders of his city, this our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put away evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Now, this kid is young enough to be dragged before the elders by his parents. They didn't wait until he's 19 or 20 years old and a strapping youth who's already learned how to use a sword and a spear and a shield. They're the ones who drag him in front of the elders. Be glad you're not under the law, young people. Proverbs 30, verse 17, The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother. The ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagles shall eat it. Ever seen a bird on the highway as you're driving along, eating roadkill, picking at it? How would you like your eye picked at by a big, fat, black bird? Ephesians 6, 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Colossians 3, 20, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Obedience is our proof of our love for God. Deuteronomy 30.20 That thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life, and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, to give to them. That's Moses speaking to the children of Israel just before they enter the promised land. The land of inheritance. The land of blessing. Obedience is always better than ritual and merely going through the motions. 1 Samuel 15, 22 and 23. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord his great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? There's the ritual. Does he delight in that as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. And here he's speaking to Saul, who has disobeyed on a tiny little point. He saved the best of the sheep and the cattle alive, and didn't kill everybody. He left Agag alive. Listen to what happened. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Young people, older people too. Remember that God said it through Samuel, a prophet. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Have you ever been involved in witchcraft? Oh, you say, no, not me. You've been involved in something as bad as witchcraft. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. You say, oh, I've never done anything immorally wrong. Iniquity, that's what it's talking about. It says, if you've been stubborn, it's just like you've got involved in immoral relations. In fact, not just that, but in idolatry. Stubbornness is like being involved in idol worship. What happened to Saul? Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. People, we don't understand this. God is serious about consequences for sin. He expects obedience. The apostles understood the principle of obedience. They were willing to suffer for it. Acts 5.29, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. They did not have the fear of man. They had the fear of the Lord. 
Obedience is one of the proofs that you're saved and controlled by the Holy Spirit. Acts 5.32 And we are His witnesses of these things, and so also is the Holy Ghost, now listen to this phrase, whom God hath given to them that obey Him. Romans chapter 6, verses 12 and 16. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Galatians 5, 7. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? 2 Thessalonians 1, 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not merely a matter of believing the gospel. Yes, that's what saves you. But if it, you're truly saved, there will be a result. You will learn to obey the gospel of Christ. Hebrews 5, 9, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that believe on him. No, that's not what it says. To all them that obey him. 1 Peter 4, 7. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? Obedience and disobedience. That's one of the tests of whether or not we have fellowship with another believer. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 14. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. God restates his command to Moses here back now in Exodus chapter 4. God restates his command after he's told Moses, your arguments are absolutely wrong and I'm mad at you about them. In fact, he'll tell us that in the next verse, which we'll study next week, the Lord willing. God was not very happy with Moses. Moses tried to argue with God. Moses tried to give excuses in which he was actually pointing at God and saying, God, you did a bad thing. Now, God restates in verse 12 his command, and he expects obedience because God is the source of our success. Verse 12, Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. When was the last time you opened your mouth to witness for Christ, to somebody you knew was lost, and who might even be scary, Pharaoh was scary, and who you knew would probably say, I don't care what you have to say. When was the last time you did it? Or are you always looking for a pushover target? You see somebody crying in the park on their hands and knees, crying out to God, Oh God, what do I have to do to be saved? And you hear them say that, and you run right over and you tell them. That's not going to happen to you very often. It does happen sometimes. But it doesn't happen very often. Go, says God. And I'll be with your mouth. I'll put the words in your mouth that you need. I'll teach you what you have to say. We can never argue with God about our physical or mental limitations. He made us that way, just like he made the dumb, the deaf, the seeing, and the blind. Remember verse 11? Who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or seeing, or the blind? Have not I, the Lord? I want to leave you with just one set of thoughts. I think it is astounding it certainly is to most of us, that God takes the credit for making people with physical and mental handicaps and deformities. All of us, because of our heritage from Adam, have some kind of deformities. We're not quite as handsome, tall, beautiful, you know, long-lived, well all the time as some other people. We all have some kind of handicap. But God takes the credit for it. That means that there are no excuses for disobeying God. Here's some obvious reasons for why God brings these things in to the lives of people. Number one, it teaches us to rely on Him rather than relying on ourselves. Number two, when anything is accomplished through us, He gets the credit. Number three, it's a reminder that this world is not our home. We are citizens of a far better country where there will be no physical or mental handicaps or deformities. Four, our physical and mental limitations are not a limitation for what God can do in us and through us. It is no problem with God, whatever your handicap is. Remember that when God calls you to do something. 
Number five, God in his wisdom used the physical and mental limitations that we experience in this world to teach the far more valuable lessons of our spiritual limitations and handicaps that the flesh can never overcome. Six, God uses the physical and mental limitations to teach us about his love for that which is unlovely. And through that, he teaches us to love people who have physical and mental limitations in the same manner that God loves us. Oh, how God has been teaching that to me. Through the two dear little boys that my daughter adopted from China. They have some serious physical limitations. And yet my heart goes out to them in love. And I realize that's the way God loves me in all my spiritual deformity and ugliness and sin. And he loves me more than I love those two precious children. He teaches us to love. And finally, God is teaching us the principle of the real effects. Listen carefully. The real effects of intergenerational sin to keep us from sinning and affecting our posterity. His blessing lasts to the thousand generations. His curse lasts to the third and fourth generation. There is an effect for our sin on those who come after us. A lot of lessons that God teaches us here through this passage as we look at Moses arguing with God and blaming God and perhaps God has brought to your mind some sin in your own life that needs to be confessed before we take part in the Lord's table this morning. Let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that you are the gracious God who cares about us, who still loves us because we are your children. And you use different things in our lives, the limitations that we have, that teach us that we can't do it on our own. That you alone are the God who is sufficient. But that you can take even a weak and fallible and sinful and ugly and broken instrument and with us and through us accomplish that which is great and glorious and majestic, brings praise to Christ. Father, if we have in our hearts any point of rebellion, any point of disobedience, any point of self-will, any point of sin, any point where we need to confess it to you, we come, Father, now at this time, confessing our sins, knowing that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Use your word with power in our hearts this day, Father, that we might partake of this, the table of our Lord, in a way that is pleasing to you. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of preparation before the Lord's table is number 413. Break thou the bread of life. We'll sing verses 